You are listening to the Wrigleyville Nation podcast. Season ticket holders and lifelong fans with neighborhood ties discuss Cubs news and neighborhood happenings. Here's your hosts, Jeremy and Pat. Hello and welcome to the Wrigleyville Nation podcast. This is episode 290 of the podcast. My name is Jeremy Deemer and I'll be your host. And I'm joined as always by my co-host. He's my cousin and he's high atop Wrigleyville tonight. How's it going, Pat? Nothing like bringing out the brooms in the city of brotherly love, is there? They're still playing baseball at the yes. major league level after the All-Star game. We will... We'll, Successfully, I might add. It, who'd have thunk it? Yeah, we'll, we, we'll talk a little bit about uh, the uh, the Philly series that just happened. We'll preview the week ahead. And we've got a special guest to help us talk about all things prospects that happened last week as the Cubs had their draft. And to help us break down uh, all the prospect happenings, friend of the show, you know him from his work at Bleacher Nation. Please welcome Brian Smith back to the show. Brian, thanks for taking time out to talk Cubs with us tonight. Yeah, excited to do it. Thanks for having me back. And uh, yeah, it was nice to see those uh, homegrown Cubs players thriving in Philly, huh? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so the, uh, the coming out of the All-Star game, the, the Cubs go into Philadelphia and... They, uh, yeah, they won three in a row, including a game in extra innings, which I didn't think they were allowed to do. Uh, very, <laughs> very surprised to see that. Um, only because, only because we thought they were not allowed to score in extra innings, which seemed to be such a, such a uh, an obstacle to overcome because the other teams did score. But it's nice to break that what seven game streak, yeah. whatever it was. Yeah, definitely, uh, uh, definitely watchable games. Um, the the series started off with a Kyle Schwarber home run, so I was in. I was ready ready to watch. Uh, Brian, were you surprised that uh, we saw so much Wilson Contreras in the uh, in the first uh, first series out of the All Star game? No, I don't think Wilson's the type of player that would uh, you know even just sort of sit by idly and let it happen. He's such a baseball rat that I feel like yeah he's gonna he's gonna want to be out there until they tell him that he can't be anymore. I held my breath, Pat, when he got hit by a pitch the first time. I held my breath every time he or Ian Happ or David Robertson took the field, which was all weekend. All weekend. Including <laughs> today. Yeah. I'm like, please, David, don't. I, mean, I just had this fear he's going to give up like six runs or something, and then his ERA would you know, balloon, and people would start questioning his arm at age 37 or whatever. But, but no, it was not that. In fact, just the opposite. He probably improved his trade value. But I do have to say – and I'm sure everyone's aware we're about a week away from the trade deadline and the Cubs have six games coming up this week, Monday, Tuesday, but Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And, uh, I am expecting, although who knows, but I'm expecting some of these trades to start happening. Right. Brian, please tell us there's going to be some trades happening. Yeah. I wonder, I wonder how much will happen this week versus, you know, the everyone just waiting on the big, the big boy trades to happen. And, you know, maybe we get a lot more busy action on the last day this year, instead of it sort of like uh, filtering in, in the last week. Yeah. I was expecting because it's a late trade deadline, the teams are going to want to get these right. trades done as soon as possible. Uh, so I was figuring right after the all-star game, the yeah. gates would open. Like, like last year with the Jack Peterson trade and then the Chafin to Para, you know, there was like this thing where it's kind of building up to the big, the big four there at the end, big five, I guess, with Kimbrel. But um, they traded off a lot of the minor pieces ahead of time. And one of the rationales for that was that it's hard for the front office to like work on trading unload seven people at once, apparently. So I think it wouldn't be, but apparently it is. And, uh, and that's sort of the position they're in right now is, we got a lot of uh, players to to shop, and uh, you know, let's see what they can do. Yeah, one of the uh, the other stories besides uh, watching the players who are uh, in their final games as Chicago Cubs was watching the players who were just starting their careers <laughs> as Chicago Cubs. Yeah, uh, let's talk about uh, uh, Brian Velasquez's success so far here at the major league level. Uh, I know you were. 
uh, a big fan of his. And uh, how is how is his uh, performance so far matching up to your expectations? Yeah, I mean, this weekend was such a great step in the right direction, not even just because of the home runs. Like, I, I thought today's game, the walk he had, he was he was down 1-2 in the count, kind of looked overwhelmed by those first few pitches and then worked his way back to a walk and and then homers in the next at bat. And so I think, you know, I think the key for him is is staying in the right plate approach mindset. And when he does, you know, I mean, if he's making contact, it's loud, hard, exciting contact. It's always just going to be a question of, you know, can he not strike out at such a rate that the numbers just, you know, can never get high enough to make it worth it. So let me ask you a question, Brian, because you're a prospects guru guy, and I think a lot of our listeners follow along sort of, but they, they tend to kind of wait until they get some prospects at the yeah higher levels before they really start to hone in on them, right? Like, so this year, I think uh, Caleb Killian and, and Davis were the, the, the ones people were starting to hone in on. But when it comes to these, like, for example, and, and neither of those actually have, have really had what we call a successful major. Like if you yet Davis right. hasn't gotten here, but instead we've seen, uh, I think the pretty, uh, I think for a lot of people, amazing development of Christopher Morrell. Yeah. And yeah. now you've got Velasquez, Nelson Velasquez. And, you know, when you look at your preseason prospect list and everybody does their rankings, I guess, you know, these guys were not the top guys in the cup system on right. anybody's list, right? So right. what do what should people make of that? Like are these guys just uh are they are they flash in the pans? Are they better than expected? Do they have a, a, a low ceiling or do they have a high ceiling and, and what does that say about the rest of the system? Yeah, I think it's I mean, I think it's a good reminder that rankings, you know, shouldn't be the only way that you digest prospect content and that, that prospects are the way that we talk about prospects are talking about a variety of outcomes that can happen. And Morell is such a perfect example because, you know, I think if people read the scouting reports about Christopher Morell that, that, you know, me and others wrote, they would say we were, they would see that we were talking about a guy with a huge ceiling, a guy that was, that was super exciting, played for a joy of played with the joy of the game, you know, had really sort of loud tools. Um, and that, you know, I guess the ranking was a hedge because there were a lot of times where he was sort of out of it for uh, out of it in terms of making contact and, you know, hitting right-handed pitching enough. And then what changed kind of, this kind year, of a streaky, kind of a streaky guy, isn't he? Or was he? He um, was, he was absolutely. And I think the thing that changed this year and we see it at the major league level is that two strike approach. I mean, you, you see how he gets down in that crouch and he, you know, kind of shrinks his own strike zone. I feel like he tracks like breaking balls in the outer half of the plate so much better out of that. And his numbers with two strikes are some of the best in baseball. So he sort of took a weakness, made it into a massive strength. And, and that, you know, I mean, had I known that that was coming, he certainly wouldn't have been, you know, the 15th ranked prospect or whatever he was in the off season. Um, but it does not shock me that he's having major league success either because the skills have always been pretty obvious there. And you make an interesting point, which is he's gotten better at baseball at a higher level, which yeah. isn't to say that he wouldn't have figured this out at a lower level either. It's, uh, but you see this sometimes in players. And I don't think it's because the minors are too easy and they needed major competition. It seems more like it just so happens they, they continue to develop. Yeah. And they're developing now at, 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 at the major league level. And, and if he were, like you said, to play, like, if he had been playing like this the last two years in the minors, you know, he had a bet on everybody's top 100 list probably. I mean, um, I think Nico's another example of that, right? Is like, I mean, Nico's been in the majors now for a couple of years, but I mean, we've seen massive development this year sure. in terms of like, I mean, his throwing arm is a great example, like never a strength in the minor leagues, never even really a strength his first couple of years in the majors was a clear point of emphasis for him this off season. And we're seeing like a huge difference. And now he could, we know he can absolutely play shortstop. So it's not, you know, I think it's a great point. It's not just about um, the skills anyone has at a given moment. It's about the, the type of guy that can get better at the skills that he knows are sort of the low hanging fruit in his development. And I'm flabbergasted with the Nico Horner defensive development at shortstop. I always thought of him as a above average maybe elite second baseman but i never thought he had the arm to play shortstop and arm is one of those things kind of like speed i don't expect people to acquire it you know right. it's like you either have it or you don't 
like I, you can acquire the strike zone judge, but you can, you can improve your power. You can, but, but, but speed or, or arm strength are things that you just sort of think are kind of like kind of built in at, at, by the time you get to that level. And he's proven us wrong. Yeah, it's fantastic. And, and it is the thing that I've really changed at doing this, uh, over the years is I think I put a lot more emphasis when I hear from people in the Cubs front office or their coaches, like this guy's a really coachable player. This guy wants to get better, you know, and like when, when that is the skill that they really want to point out and you kind of see those skills that, that they could get better at. I tend to rank those players higher now than I'm, than I maybe used to because I see that that is really the difference in productive major leaguers and guys that don't really make it are the guys that keep, keep getting better. And making adjustments along the way, too. We've seen that yep. in morale this season. You know, he went through a stretch after that hot start where he struck out like half the time for a couple of weeks. And really, instead of getting down on himself and heading back to AAA, he was able to work his way out of it. And he's right back up, you know, hitting the 280s again and, and making good contact with hard velocity and, and just doing the things that, you know, now over what, over 250 plate appearances. So yeah. it's not, it's not as fluky as when it was well as first 50 at bats or something like that. It's, it's becoming more of a sustainable, foreseeably foreseeable future for him. Well, yeah. And it, that's with David Ross taking too long to move him down in the lineup as well. Uh, but once he got down there, then yeah, he had time to, uh, uh, to make those adjustments and you love to, be able to see a player do that without having to get sent down as we've seen so many times with uh, following prospects throughout the years is uh, they have to go right themselves down in triple uh, a. So this was uh, uh, I was excited to see Morel be able to work through that uh, as well. And Fun back fact. towards the top of the lineup again. Fun fact, uh, Morel next to PJ Higgins, who I don't count because he hasn't played nearly as much, but uh, Christopher Morrell has the highest slugging percentage on the Cubs, higher than higher than Patrick Wisdom, higher than Contreras, higher than any, uh, Ian Happ or anybody else. So that's a testament to how hard he's hitting the ball, I think. And and something I always like to that I enjoy watching is that he's doing it with a smile because man, like there's not a lot to smile about on this team, but Christopher Morrell's having the time of his life, the time of his life out there, and I love it. It's yeah. it, it's great to see, just a great personality. Uh, yeah, and so uh, on the uh, you know looking ahead to uh, to some of the some of the players we haven't seen yet, Brian, who are who are some of the players that uh, that, that haven't been called up yet that you're looking forward to seeing getting opportunities post trade deadline with the team? Yeah, who's who's close? I think people yeah. want to know. I know they've got some great players in low A and high A, but who at the double AA, A, triple A level do you say, hey, this person's within reach of playing at the majors? Yeah, I think the big exciting one right now is Matt Mervis, who is a first baseman that is, you know, probably uh, set to be the Cubs minor league player of the year if things just keep going at even a, you know, slightly less pace than what he's been on. And um, and somebody that's definitely like the breakout star of the year on the farm. He was a guy that was undrafted in 2020, um, did not play particularly well last year in low A, and this year has gone from high A to double A, and now just played a second game in triple a hit a home run and a triple uh, big, you know, sort of first baseman lefty slugger type uh, has really been able to tap into his power this year. And it's legitimate, you know, I mean, hits, you know, 110 mile per hour balls and stuff. So it, you know, I think the power will play uh, doesn't walk quite as much yet as you'd like for a first baseman. Um, but he's he's shown that in the past, and you know maybe that's one of those adjustments that we'll see down the road. But he is a guy that I think is a really nice fit when you look at sort of the Cubs roster and and the variety of holes it has. That's one that um, that he could come into and plug a spot that is definitely plaguing the Cubs this year. Where was he preseason on your on was he even on your on your top thirty list? Uh, no, he was or, he was not top fifty. But I, you know, I guess my 50. point. My, my point of pride was that I, I also ranked another, or I didn't rank them. I put another 50 guys in honorable mention and I, I kept him in there. And honestly, I think that there were people, you know, I think you could have looked at the system and not because they, he was a 22 year old that really struggled in low a as a hitter last year. And so, um, he was, it's been, he was more likely to be DFA than, than make it to triple a this season, probably. Right. Right. Yes. Uh, I think, I think that's totally fair. 
and now here we are. So, and, and like you said, that's a position of need, and uh, we could certainly use some power, um, you know, in the corner. So that's we'll see how that progresses. But do you see him even? Do you see him possibly coming up in September? Do you see this is more of a next year kind of thing? Yeah, that's going to be an interesting question because, I mean, the way that some of this stuff is going to work down the stretch here is the Cubs are going to have these sort of 40-man roster uh, medium-term concerns to think about because Mervis is not Rule 5 eligible this offseason, so he does not need to be added to the 40-man technically until 2023. And so they'd have to ask themselves, are we comfortable with him taking up a spot if that means that, you know, somebody like, I don't know, Cole Franklin, who's my number 14 prospect who's in a ball and, and further away, but would be the kind of guy that if he's not on the 40 man, this off season could get taken in the rule five draft. So right. the Cubs have to look sort of down the line a little bit to assess who they're going to call up after the trade deadline. It's a weird sort of uh, game of chicken that Jed's going to have to play with a future decision he has to make in November. Well, and if you're just bringing a guy up to triple A now who started the season in a ball, I think there's a, there's an argument you made for not rushing him. And yep. you still have Revis and other people you probably want to give a little bit of a look to just to see what they can do. So with the 40 man issue out there, that, I think you're, I think you're sort of alluding to the idea that, you know, don't, uh, don't cause yourself to lose another prospect just to bring him up for, for a exactly. few meaningless at bats in September, you know, when he might yeah, not I, even be ready yet. I think a lot of the guys that we're going to see in the next two months are guys that, that they're sort of on the fence themselves with you know is this a 40 man guy or not and they are going to give them a look and they're going to they're going to assess not just sort of the play in the major leagues or the results but the skills they're seeing and you know that'll be a chance for david ross to have some input on players that he hasn't seen before and um yeah that's that's the kind of player i imagine more than than us seeing any real top prospects down the stretch are just seeing sort of a lot of guys that are fringer do you see the return of Caleb Killian this year? I was sort of on the fence about it. And then he was really good in his start the other day. Uh, I yeah. think if he, if he strings together probably three more good, good starts where he's showing feel, I think is the most important thing that he was lacking is like, I mean, it just looked to me like he wasn't even like feeling the seams on the baseball, like in his normal way, you know? And so if he can be doing that, I think absolutely. I think they'd love to give him, a couple starts and have him sort of um, if he has anything built up in his head that the major leagues are something special and that he has to think and pitch differently, like get through that initial point and just like start being himself when he's in Wrigley field again. And I think that'd be a really useful way to spend, uh, you know, four turns around the rotation. In sure. September. And, and he's at an age too, where it makes sense. I mean, he's not, he's not old by any stretch, but you know, he's, he's in an age where you'd like to see him performing, you know, at the major league level, certainly by next year and yeah. getting over that hump from those last two disastrous outings he had in the majors this year, which may be psychological at this point. You don't want him to have to dream about that for six months. <laughs> right. Season if you can help it. Yeah. I think, I mean, a lot of the season to me is answering questions about next year when you start to build that team. And one of the things I think you have to answer is like, what can we count on Caleb Killian to produce for the 2023 team? It doesn't have to be an opening day rotation spot, but can he sort of be their sixth starter that they start in Iowa and realize is probably going to get 15, 18 starts? Like, are they comfortable with that much role? And that's, that's something they can answer down the stretch. Is there, so we, we know Caleb Killian, but we also know that fans are, are dying to see, a, uh, a developed pitching prospect make it through the cup yeah. system to the major leagues. How far are we from <laughs> seeing one make it? <laughs> we, we always feel like we're about a year and a half away. Right. I feel like I'm going to tell you a year and a half. Uh, <laughs> you remember when Braylon Marquez came up and started yeah. at the end of the shortened season and we're like, oh, just wait till next year. And he hasn't thrown up all since. I think, I think what's happened in the last couple of weeks with Jordan Wicks, uh, the first round pick from 2021, his development has been really good. He, um, he was getting some funky results at the beginning of the year in high A, uh, but it seems like sort of bad luck. I mean, he had like one of the highest BABIPs in the minor leagues and just wasn't really making sense. And then he got hot and uh, he got promoted to double A a week ago. 
And I think he is, he is the type of guy that, that seems like the one that will end that streak. He's real polished. He's not one that's going to, I think, get real wild or anything like that. He has a four pitch mix that I think the Cubs are really comfortable that it's getting to the point where they're not going to have to tweak pitches anymore. I think they might add one more pitch, but at that point it would be like the fifth offering. And uh, he is, I think the guy that will, that will sort of come up as the one that they developed all the way through and, and will snag a rotation spot. And that'll probably happen. I could see him starting games in 2023 and then like entrenched in the rotation at some point in 2024. And what, where do you think his realistic, not as high end necessarily, but like the, the realistic, like rotation spot for somebody like that is like, where do you see him? Sure. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think he's sort of that three, four type naturally um, that, that eats a lot of innings, dependable sort of every fifth day kind of guy. I mean, sort of like when John Lackey was at his best in terms of they're not similar pitchers, but you know, just that sort of mindset when he was like pitching really well and you just felt like you could count on him, uh, not sort of John Lackey at the end where he was like the clear fifth starter. Um, well, I'd like to think of it as more of a, like a Matt Clement, if you want to go all the way back to the sure. 2000, 2003 force. I mean, he was a really solid pitcher who on a good team was a fourth starter, but could have been a third starter on most teams at the time. Yep. Yeah, I think that's a good that's a good match. Well, that's our that's the Cubs 2021 draft. Uh, draft. Pick. Let's talk <laughs> about the Cubs' 2022 draft that took oh, yeah. place transition last week. I'm a pro- <laughs> professional podcaster, podcasting professionally. Uh, so now, I, I, I got to ask you, Brett and, and Jeremy, as, as we get into this. Yes, you know, a lot of people were predicting. A lot of Cubs fans on Twitter were hoping that with the first pick, number seven overall, the Cubs were going to end up with a guy who was going to be in the MLB top 100 prospect list, or at least very close to that. Um, and I think people were initially puzzled by the Cubs draft, but um, obviously there was a there was a, a strategy. Can you explain to everybody what the strategy was and what you think about it? Yeah, the baseball draft is such a weird thing that um, because there's a cap to how much you can spend, it becomes this weird puzzle where it's not just about the best player available. It's about fitting every one of your picks within this puzzle. And, you know, the Cubs have only 10 uh 10 million dollars in change to spend on the draft and it's that's not the result of you know tom ricketts being cheap that's the result of the rules by major league baseball and so um you both, know, can yeah, if we're, if we're, both can be true both can be true if we're up to ricketts it would have been seven million so <laughs> that's <yeah>. right, <laughs> right. <laughs> uh so i think the cubs looked looked at that draft they looked at, at the numbers of the guys they were interested in including some of the hitters that i think you know cubs twitter wanted them to draft and Uh, they decided that it's essentially think of it like the NFL that they traded down instead of having sort of the seventh pick and the 47th pick, they got the uh, 13th and the 23rd or something like that. So that they're going to end up coming away with these two pitchers, Cade Horton in the first round, Jackson Ferris in the second round that are pretty close in terms of prospect caliber um, that, you know, Cade Horton might not have been a, a guy that a lot of people thought was the seventh pick, but I think if you look at those guys as the 13th and the 23rd, it actually looks pretty good. And and there were, but I think I, one of the concerns people had is there were a lot of like high, were perceived to be high level bats available for the Cubs, like yeah. guys who we didn't expect to be available, but there were not just one of them or two of them, there were three of them at the time. And I think that's what really kind of befuddled people is that it seemed like, because the other teams also made some unusual decisions yeah. that uh, it was really kind of wide open um, at the Cubs slot for players, uh, you know, who are very enticing, but. Well, I think, no, I think they, that's a great, that that's a good point was that, uh, you know, I think that was some of the questions that people had was uh, the Cubs seemed to not want to bend from this plan that they had. They, they had right. their plan. They were going to yeah, do it regardless in, of who fell to them. Plan, right. Yeah. It seems like they almost went in with this plan, right? Because of given the players that they let pass, you know, that were surprisingly available at their pick. Yeah, I think I I think they definitely went in with that plan. I think Dan Kantrovitz even said as much that that was something that they outlined to Jed uh, that morning. Um, I do think that if Tamar Johnson, who was the first round pick by the Pirates in the four spot, if he dropped to seven, I do believe that the Cubs would have 
sort of gone off course and picked him. I think they really, really liked him. Um, but I think that this was sort of the plan that if it wasn't Termar, it was going to be Cade. And uh, what did you think of uh, uh, of Cade Horton? Was he uh, someone that you were uh, uh, that you were reading the scouting reports on going into this draft, or was he one of those uh, uh, like in your fantasy baseball drafts where you're you're uh, having to to dig to the back to find who this person was that someone selected? It was closer to that, but I had watched uh, I had sort of watched one of Cade's College World Series starts sort of in the background and uh, was sort of just familiar with him from that. And then when the Cubs drafted him, I ended up, you know, sitting down and watching his last five starts completely and then, you know, parts of maybe five others or so. And uh, so I got familiar. Um, he's he's a fun one. He's a big upside swing as a pitcher. I mean, he I think the Cubs are thinking, you know, that they're – he obviously has not pitched very much. He came back from Tommy John surgery this spring, uh, was starting just as a reliever. It actually wasn't going particularly well, had an ERA of seven something going into May, uh, then learned a slider uh, from one of his teammates playing catch in the outfield. They brought it <laughs> into a bullpen and then they brought it into a game during the SEC, uh, the Big 12, excuse me, the Big 12 uh, tournament. And it was one of the best pitches in college baseball. And, you know, it helped Oklahoma get to the college world series. He pitched in the championship of the college world series, struck, you know, struck out more guys in two college world series starts, I believe than anyone ever, maybe except Kumar rocker, but uh, it was, it was quite the rise. It was, it's a, it's an amazing story. It's almost like a mythical one, the way the slider just sort of comes up. And the other pitcher you mentioned, Jackson Ferris. Uh, what is uh, what should Cubs fans be excited about for uh, uh, for Jackson Ferris at this pick? Yeah, I think Jackson is sort of that typical like high school first round arm that that's fun to dream on. He's you know is six foot four. He could probably add 25, 30 pounds of muscle in the next few years. So like he's he's pitching up to about. 94 95 i think touch 96 but you know the kind of arm that you can say man after 25 pounds could he be up even higher than that uh and and then he's a guy that has thrown four pitches he transferred to sort of the infamous img academy for his senior year and learned a pitch there and uh ha- has shown a lot of comfort throwing multiple things so he is uh he's a fun one to dream on he's far away he's got a nice foundation uh but, you know, it's not a not a kind of player the Cubs have had in the system for a long time. They have avoided high school pitchers at the top, uh, you know, since before Theo Epstein was around. So this is this is a new one. Yeah. And you mentioned Theo Epstein and the Cubs models before. Some people were surprised to see that the Cubs drafted so many pitchers. And I'm not when I say yeah. some people, I mean, not people like you, but some other people. Um, and it shouldn't really be that surprising because this has been the Cubs strategy for years. I mean, they had the whole Mm -hmm. get a, get a bat with a top pick and then draft all pitchers pretty much. Uh, They did that routinely during the early Epstein years. And they, as you pointed out, drafted a lot of college pitchers, the Jake Stinnett's of the world or whatever. And, and uh, with horrible success, to be honest, Um, it just, you know, those are supposed to be the less risky guys, maybe lower upside, but less risky because they're farther along in their development. And yet basically none of them developed, at least not with the Cubs. I saw Paul Blackford in the All-Star game the other day, but um, you know, what, so what's different about this go around that Cubs fans can feel more optimistic about than the countless years that they, um, that they tried this and failed. Yeah, I think what's changed is sort of the inputs into their draft models, which is to say that, you know, when they were drafting those college pitchers that you mentioned, and that definitely was their strategy, uh, I think it was based on, you know, I think their their models were had a lot of, like, college statistics were in there, and they were really projecting based on some of that stuff, and uh, they thought that they were, you know, sort of low-risk uh, gambles. And the thing that has changed is if you look at the pitchers they drafted this year, like, they come from everywhere. They come from tiny schools, you know, junior colleges, like one guy that, that isn't even in school that was just in the draft league. 
the only thing that mattered to the Cubs models this year is stuff. And they, they have guys that their arms move really fast. And, you know, guys that I think that they know they can teach some of the secondary stuff to, but they're not going to have to worry about, you know, can this guy get from 91 to 94, which is the thing that, that stalled so many of those guys in the 2010s is, you know, as baseball got more and more oriented around raw stuff and the stuff in baseball got so much better from 2010 to 2020, uh, the Cubs were behind there and they are determined not to be behind now. They are, they are filling the system with as many guys that throw above 95 as they can. Do you think this is a scouting director influence or is this a Carter Hawkins by the way, that's the Cubs general manager. For those of you who don't know who Carter Hawkins is, I don't blame you for not knowing since he's never spoken, yeah. but um, uh, publicly. But uh, is is that he came from Cleveland and that seemed to be their mo there? I mean, is that do you think he's the one driving that, or is it a combination of that's how the scouting department wants to do it and the GM? Or what's the what do you think the influences are behind this, or is it a Jed thing? I don't know. Like, tell me. Yeah, I mean, I think it's probably a combination of a lot of things, but I think that that Carter definitely probably has some influence on just the overall philosophy of the organization in terms of, you know, what do we develop where, you know, what are the what are the types of things that we're going to develop the best? And then the other one that that I don't think gets talked about as much is Craig Breslow uh, is the Cubs pitching. uh, He's in charge of pitching development in the organization, and he's widely considered, you know, I think one of the brightest young, younger guys in baseball. He was a left-handed reliever. People might remember him from the two thousands, um, but Ivy league educated guy. And um, the Cubs have had a lot of success by sort of the raw uh, data that people are keeping track of. Like driveline keeps track of the average stuff that each minor league system has. And the Cubs were in the mid twenties last year and they're second this year. And Craig Breslow gets a lot of that credit. And I think the Cubs have a ton of confidence in what he and his team can do. And I think that is part of the uh, impetus behind going 17 out of 20 picks being pitchers. I always viewed him. I always remember him as being sort of a, uh, he might not have been a money ball guy specifically, but he was, he was one of those uh, uh, A's uh, players that, uh, that did better than you anticipated <laughs> as a major league player. I don't know yeah, what his exactly. career was, but I just remember he was good at the A's. One of um, those guys that just la- lasted a lot longer than his stuff would have suggested. Right. Yeah, kind of a Billy Bean type of guy. But um, So, okay, well, given this sort of shift in strategy that the Cubs have, what are the timelines for some of these guys? Like, are are we – I mean, they, they, some of these guys are, are younger, some are older. I mean, is there anybody who the Cubs drafted who you think might – be on the fast track or, or is this going to be just a long slow slog for everybody i think it's going to be slow i mean i think that they view Cade as Cade horton the, the first pick as somebody that if what he was showing in june was totally real i mean it's really not stuff that would belong in a ball i mean he would get through a ball really fast with the way he was pitching in june so i think that he could move quickly in that sense they are going to have to teach him uh, some stuff. He's going to have to refine his curveball. He's going to have to, you know, get a lot more confidence throwing changeups. He'll probably do even little tweaks on the fastball and slider that they love. Uh, but he's one that could be his adjustments could be coming at the upper levels or even, you know, in the majors where he's sort of adding a pitch up there. So he can move quickly. And then the other one would be their fifth round pick, Brandon Birdsell out of Texas Tech, who's a big right handed pitcher that, that throws in the upper nineties has like the shortest arm action I think I've ever seen and just scream sort of seventh, eighth inning reliever. And he could move really quick as well. Yeah. The, the rest of these uh, picks are are, uh, teenagers. So uh, yeah, mostly lottery tickets. uh, So you'll, you'll see how that, how they develop uh, over a longer course for sure. Uh, One of the other strategies uh, that all major league teams seem to do is draft MLB player kids, draft athlete kids. <laughs> yeah. uh, so Cubs did one as well. So they drafted uh, Mark McGuire's son, Mason McGuire, uh, with the eighth round pick. Um, <laughs> who who do we see at 
uh, Wrigley Fields uh, getting an ovation sooner. Uh, Mark McGuire or Sammy Sosa based on Mason <laughs> McGuire's draft. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, my, my joke with Mason so far has been, cause if you look at him, he's like this, he's six foot four and real skinny. And so the word that, you know, you're going to use when you analyze a prospect with like him is projectable. And I was like, if you're going to project whether or not a guy can add weight and, you know, put on some muscle <laughs> over the years, a McGuire is a pretty good gamble for that. <laughs> yeah, he yeah, knows I a mean, guy who might be able to help him with that. <laughs> right. Imagine if, if just, you know, for the Cardinals sake, imagine if Mark McGuire's son played for the Cubs and just to stick the knife in, maybe next year the Cubs could draft Yadier Molina's grandchildren or something. And, <laughs> and then we could really, we could really uh, quarter the market on, on the children of, of, uh, Cardinals. Um, I have a question for the two of you. Well, first of all, I'm going to tell you a little fun fact here. Um, The amateur draft baseball started in 1965, and we've talked about this on the show before. The first ever number one overall pick in the amateur draft was none other than Rick Monday uh, by the Los Angeles Dodgers. He was a future Cub. He's the one who uh, grabbed the flag that was set on fire in the outfield, blah, 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 So, uh, and was a good hitter for the Cubs. However, uh, the Cubs, some people think, well, the Cubs have, have failed to have success in the first round a lot, and they're, they complain about that. But you, you haven't seen anything until you look at 1965, the first year of the draft, all, all the way through 1980, when all the Cubs' first-round picks combined ended up with negative war in the major oh. leagues. <laughs> so, Incredible. So, no stars there, folks. Um, the question for you two is can you name the Cub? Who has accumulated the first the Cub first round draft pick? Who has accumulated the most lifetime WAR? Uh, and I guess I should say uh, first the the pitcher or the the player has accumulated the most lifetime WAR. Then I could also ask secondarily, how about WAR as a Cub? Because because as you can imagine, not all players drafted by the Cubs stayed with the Cubs. Sure, um, man, I. I'm just trying to think of who's been better than Chris Bryant. Um, let's see. Yeah, Sean Dunson didn't get there. Uh, I can nope. tell you that. Um, nope, you're 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 hot. Uh, it is in fact Chris Bryant as is a it? Cub. Yep. Wow. Now the, the most lifetime WAR of a Cub first round draft pick overall is uh is not uh, Chris Bryant. That that honor. Uh, goes to somebody uh, who had a lifetime war of almost 72. That would be Rafael Palmero, ah, nice. uh, who only had a little bit with the Cubs, followed by Josh Donaldson. <laughs> uh, Josh Donaldson. And, yeah. Um, a, catcher, Cubs, a, a catching first yeah. round pick. Yeah. Yeah. 46.5. The Cubs traded him, of course. Is it in the Rich the, Harden, uh, Harden deal? Yeah. yeah, the Rich Harden deal. Um, so the top three all time. Uh, as Cubs, though, you've got Chris Bryant, number one. Uh, you've got uh, uh, Kerry Wood. And you've got uh, number three, you've got Javier Baez. Names that you would expect to be kind of in that in that group. Um, so, yeah, a lot of that's been done recently. So, you know, <laughs> as much as we, years. as much as, yeah, as much as we can point to the Hayden Simpson deals or the the Brendan Littles or Ryan Jensen's of the world or Ed Howard's or guys who, who may or may not ever make it. Uh, we definitely in the last decade or so have had some of our best uh, first round draft picks. And uh, there you go. So, uh, and, and of course there's still some others like Ian Happ and Kyle Schwarber who have plenty of time to continue to be good. So we'll see how they, how they fare ultimately, but. Mark Pryor, by the way, was at 16.6, if anybody thought that he might be. And I think he did that in his first three seasons. So that's pretty impressive. Um, but then, yeah, he flattened out after that. So, so Brian, a lot, of the, a lot of the post-draft talk now is around signing these prospects here, these yeah. draftees. Um, is there any uh, – is this, is this just something to talk about? Or is there a risk that the Cubs can't sign these guys – uh, because most of them are, you know, they did save a lot of money here on some of these these selections. So is there is there any real risk that they, they don't end up signing these guys? No, I don't think so. I think that that has really changed in baseball since those bonus pools, which is sort of that, you know, money that you're allotted that I talked about earlier. When that went into place, what you see 
so much less than than if you look at the draft 20 years ago are guys drafted early that don't sign i think last year the stat was the top 300 players drafted the every player drafted in the top 10 rounds there were two players that didn't sign uh so it is very important and i and i know the cubs do it when the cubs are getting ready to draft a player they call the player or the player's agent they not only tell them that they want to draft him but they want they tell them what they want to pay him and uh, there's sort of a loose agreement made even before the pick is made about, okay, this is a number, we're in the right area, and then you pick the guy. So the Cub, I'm very confident the Cubs will sign all of their first 10 picks. Some guys that they picked on day three probably will end up going to college or something, but that's part of the game as well. And, and when you draft someone who's uh... – uh, when you draft so many uh, far earlier than anticipated, like they did this year too, yeah, I am sure it's easy to make those deals because it's not like there are a bunch of other teams saying we're going to draft you seventh overall or higher, right? I mean, it was, I mean, yeah, part no of what you're doing is you're saying, hey, that. we're we're we'll pay you four point four million dollars. You know, I don't know that a a team if if you fall four more picks, then you're not even you know below slot anymore. You're going to be a above slot player and you're probably not going to find a home at that number. So, you know, will you take $4.4 million to play with us? And, you know, I think that makes sense for them. Yeah, for sure. Because you could really fall. And once you do that, then, you know, you could fall into the teens or or twenties and then, then then you're, you'd be really uh, doing yourself a disservice. 4 million seems like a lot for for a kid who's probably that age too, I would imagine. So uh, take the money and run. (laughs) <laughs> a, that's, um, that's my advice that's, that's uh, advice. super agent pat take the money and yeah. run he says yeah, the, yeah. <laughs> speaking um, of taking money and running uh can i ask a quick question just completely off this uh off this current draft topic but i couldn't help but notice yesterday i saw a name that i remember from my childhood uh miguel amaya uh who was a cubs <laughs> catching prospect in the 70s and uh no uh a few years ago who has battled a lot of injuries and the COVID season. And I think a lot of people had, had, I mean, he was a top three cups prospect on a lot of lists, uh, you know, just, just three years ago. Right. And then, you know, things have really, or two years ago, things have deteriorated uh, uh, with his health. And now he's back, I think sooner than I anticipated uh, and, and doing, and he did a very nice uh, debut first couple games. What can you tell yeah. us about this this development? Because he was the catcher of the future. Yeah, it's exciting to see him back. He had Tommy John surgery. I'm trying to think when it was. I mean, it was probably it was some point over the winter, I believe. Um, Saw the picture of him on Twitter with his arm in a cast. That's always a scary thought. Right, exactly. And so I think the early uh, reports were that he was going to miss the whole season. Uh, I think it might be true that he might not catch this season, at least during yeah. sort of the the baseball regular season. I think he will, they'll find a home for him in winter ball somewhere to get him the reps catching again, but uh, pretty great. Thing. I mean, he's going to get two months here to, to take yeah, a bat. For and, sure. That's um, huge. That's yeah, more he, than you got in the COVID year. Anybody, yep. right. You know, and so he needed that. Uh, Cause he's, he's, you know, he's, Again, not old, but not young anymore. Um, a lot of these guys kind of fell into that, that category where a couple of years go by and all of a sudden you go from being a young up-and-comer to sort of, I don't want to say middle-aged as a prospect, but, I mean, how old is he now, 25? 20, 23, almost 24. Oh, okay, 24, okay. But, but yeah, it, it's nice to see some upward uh, progress because, you know, with all the all the – Rumors swirling around about the trade of the likely trade of Wilson Contreras. You know, one of the questions people ask is, "Well, what are we going to do for a catcher?" Right. And um, Gomes, baby, on Gomes. Yeah, yeah, on Gomes, the home run hitter, on Gomes. But but it is nice to at least have somebody in your system who you're high on, you know, within the next year or so. And, and if he can stay healthy, do you see him possibly progressing? Whereby, you know, let's say another. A healthy two months and a healthy next year by September of next year making his debut or is that pushing it too much no I, I don't think it's pushing it if the results are there I, I think one of the nice things like I mean when he came back and he had three extra base hits in his first two games it's a different swing than it was 
uh, last year even. Uh, so yeah. I think some development has even happened sort of from the sidelines. You know, I think they, they, he probably worked with the hitting coaches and sort of came back healthy with a new plan of attack. And I think it's one that's going to hopefully allow him to get into his power a little bit more. And, and he can sort of, maybe he can hit, become that sort of 15 to 25 home run guy that they, we were hopeful about when he was an A ball. And so yeah, I don't know how fast it's going to come from a hitting standpoint. I mean, I feel like losing that much time and getting the reps is going to is going to mean that, you know, a little polish comes off and you got to get that back, but he's on the 40 man roster. If the results are there, they're going to they're going to be willing to give him a look. And so if whether that's, you know, late next year or even, you know, if he I think what he could do this year is play well enough to give them confidence to start him in Iowa next year. And if he's in yeah. Iowa playing well on the 40 man roster, they would absolutely look at him. And, and that's a situation where a guy who was a top prospect who then kind of fell off to the point where a lot of people had sort of, I mean, I don't say they wrote him off, but you know, he was a, he was an afterthought in a lot of people's minds, getting him back all of a sudden. And if he is uh, healthy and, and performing, it's, that's like getting an extra first round pick too. You didn't expect. I mean, he's uh, he could be a major uh, contributor for in a position of, of definite um, weakness yeah. uh, or need, I guess. So that's huge. Brian, last question from me. Um, as you're watching this draft unfold and you're watching players come off your list that you were anxious to see where they landed, uh, was there any teams in the Cubs division, in the NL Central, that took a player where you said, ooh, I wish he went anywhere but our division. Uh, was there any any of those guys that came off the board uh, that went to a Brewers, Cardinals, or or Pirates uh, that, that we need to be on the, on the lookout for? Well, I think what was really funny was we sort of talked about how there were three, four hitters that, uh, you know, the Cubs were – the Cubs Twitter, I guess, was hoping the Cubs would pick and would have been happy with. And I think the guy that that everyone seemed honed in on, and there were a lot of rumors the Cubs really liked him, was was Cam Collier, who's Lou Collier's son. Uh, I think grew up even in Chicago. I think Lou had a baseball academy in Chicago when Cam was a little younger, and so he's got ties to Chicago. Really good player. Uh, Cubs end up not picking him. And then it's just like, you know, is it, is it not fate that he falls to an NL central team? He goes not eighth or not seventh to the Cubs drops all the way to 18 where the reds are just thrilled to get him. Uh, of course they are just <laughs> so annoying. I mean, it's as if the reds got to be good last year and weren't penalized for it at all in the draft. They still got to pick the, they still got a player as if they'd lost 90 games. Right. That's frustrating. Yeah, I think the two hitters that I seem to seem to see most people were hoping would fall to the Cubs ended up with the Pirates and the Reds. So that's fun. Brutal. Uh, Pat, any last questions for Brian before we... Uh, yeah. Go? So, Brian, uh, you and, and others do prospect lists uh, some, at the beginning of the season, but also periodically throughout the year. And mm -hmm. coming into this season, a lot of prospect lists had the Cubs sort of middle of the pack, 15th-ish, you know, kind of in that zone where there was a lot of credit given to the Cubs having some good young players, but because they were so young, there was a, a hesitance to, to, you know, move the Cubs up any higher than they were. Meanwhile, like the, the Cardinals were much higher than the Cubs in, in the prospect rankings, et cetera. And now that we've played over half a season of minor league ball and we've seen the development and now we have another draft on top of that, um, uh, behind us, even without the the trade deadline, because we don't know what the Cubs are going to get back in the trade deadline, so that's hard to hard to calculate. But but just where we are as of today, where would you say that you think the Cubs rank uh, versus their peers in Major League Baseball as, as a team organization for their prospects? Their I prospects would say them, six, I, I would say six through ten. I would say the Cubs are not a top five farm system because they do not have sort of the top 30 prospects that uh, top 30 in all of baseball prospects that I think you kind of need to have in your system to be a top five overall system. But I think they have so much uh, solid depth in the system. And, you know, you look at a site like Fangraphs that, that shows yeah. you the They're future value. Up, 
<laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, they might be up at four or five in the Fangraphs ones, but yeah, I think what's what Fangraphs helps show is they have so many, they have so much depth. They have so many guys that Fangraphs has at forty and above um, in in terms of future value on a twenty to eighty scale, and so uh, that's that's the thing that has them coming up. And I, I would say, yeah, somewhere six to ten makes sense to me. And, and of course, we don't necessarily want 40 uh, David Bodies coming up. We, we definitely want guys right. who are going to make more of an impact. But then again, for every every player in that 40, 45 range, the Christopher Morels pop up, too, because that's just yep. the way it goes, right? You know, get enough of them. Some of them are going to – some of them are not going to be that. Some will be exactly that. Some will be better. So and, it's always good to have big numbers. And some you can trade for – established yep. assets later uh that's like who oh, oh uh mm, well that's that's a story for another podcast we are uh, up against time today so brian smith thank you again for coming on to talk cubs prospects with us please remind all of our listeners where they can find your work sure yeah i i write uh, a couple posts a week at bleacher nation and i am on twitter at, at cub cub prospects yeah, definitely uh, give him a follow. Make sure you read his stuff over at Bleacher Nation. Always a pleasure, Brian. Thank you for, for coming on. And you can also follow us on Twitter at Wrigleyville Net. Same for Instagram, Facebook.com slash Wrigleyville Nation as well. We have a Patreon. That's how we keep this podcast ad-free for our fourth straight season because of all of our generous patrons over at Patreon.com slash Wrigleyville Nation. Get yourself a shout out here on the show. Get yourself a t-shirt. We've got all that stuff going on over at the Patreon. Check it out. And uh, with that, we are going to wrap it up here. Uh, Pat, any final thoughts before we call it a podcast? Free Juan Soto. <laughs> lots of uh, free, lots of trade free, talk next free week. Bring him to the Cubs. Bring him to the Cubs. <laughs> we, <laughs> uh, that's my only thought. Bring him not to the Cardinals. Ideally, yes, the Cubs. that's what I meant. Yeah, that's... that's sort of what I was saying. Yeah, <laughs> or send them to like the Angels or someplace where they're never seen again. Um, something like that. <laughs> we will have plenty of post trade deadline and uh, and pre trade deadline trade talk in the next week. In the, in the next two weeks, we'll be talking nonstop trades. Uh, as the, the, the Cubs dismantle the, the rest of their roster. So uh, make sure you're stayed subscribed to this feed. Make sure that you're telling your Cub fan friends about the podcast. Show them how to subscribe to a podcast. There's going to be a lot going on. They're going to have a lot of questions. Be like, hey, why aren't you listening to the Wrigleyville Nation podcast? They just covered that topic. Make sure you tell your Cub <laughs> fan friends about us. We appreciate it. Uh, all the word of mouth that you spread about the podcast. We couldn't do it without you for this many seasons. So thank you to all of our listeners. Thanks, Brian Smith. Pat, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Jeremy. Thanks, everyone, for listening. And we'll talk to you again next time.